All good, Peťo? Is it okay if I sit back? Yeah, no problem, just chill a bit. <laughs> you had your little workshop there? It was nice. <laughs> okay. Can <laughs> Já se taky velice omlouvám, tady to trošku na, dneska natáčíme tak zlehka, tak to bude možná takové trošku legrační, ale jestli jedem, tak... Přátelé, kamarádi, vítám vás tady na dnešní přednášce s mým hostem Rezou Bavarem. Uh, so Reza, I start in Czech, later we will continue in English. Ahoj. Ahoj. Uh, that, that was one question I want to ask you, uh, if you know some Czech words, but okay. Uh, you surprised me. <laughs> Vítejte na dnešní přednášce. Děkuji moc všem, kteří jste dojeli od Aše, Ostravy, Plzně, Liberce. Zkrátka odkudkoliv. Říkali jsme si, že pro nás bude úspěch na této první akci, když přijede aspoň někdo mimo Prahu. Takže jsem extrémně rád za to, že jste všichni dorazili. Abych vám tak nějak představil, o co se tady vlastně dneska pokoušíme, tak měli jsme takový nápad. Před rokem jsme začali točit s Shanty videa, která, měli, která měla krásnou stylistiku, docela i obsah, řekl bych, jsem tam nějaký blbý vtip. A tak jsme si řekli, kam dál bychom s tímhle mohli zajít. A tak se v hlavě zrodil nápad, že bychom tady mohli přivést hosty ze všech koutů světa a povídat si s nima na dýmkarská témata a nějakým způsobem tady oživit tu dýmkarskou komunitu taky o názory zvenčí. A jestli se to povedlo nebo ne, tak uvidíme až na konci dnešního dne. Každopádně mým prvním hostem je Reza Bavar, což je vlastně zakladatel celého segmentu hms neboli velekněz značky Kalout. Všichni ho známe díky Kalout Lotusu, což byl jeho převratný vynález, ale nejenom dýmkami je živ, býval to velmi, jak to říct, aktivní podnikatel, taky právník, zároveň má rád jogu, cestování, fotografování a všechny tyhle další věci, takže nejenom dýmkařsky si tady dneska budeme povídat. Tak nějak, co nás dneska čeká, tak začneme diskutovat. Diskuze má nějaké čtyři bloky a potom, nebo klidně i během, záleží, co vás jako napadne, můžete pokládat otázky z publika. Reza říkal, že půjde přímo k věci, cut the bullshit, takže uvidíme, pokud máte nějaké otázky, věřím, že vám velice rád odpoví. Co se týče organizace, tak bohužel tím, jak tady natáčíme a kolik se nás tady dneska vlezlo, tak dýmky bohužel tady úplně nejsou možné, takže se omluvám, že vás tady budeme provokovat. Na druhou stranu, pokud byste byli unavení nebo chtěli si na chvilku odechnout, tak v přední části dýmky jsou pro vás připraveny. A pokud je to takhle všechno, co si myslím, že jsem chtěl říct, tak můžeme přistoupit k samotné diskuzi. A já bych si jenom přál, abyste si to užili a berte v potaz, je to náš první pokus, tak buďte schovývaví. Děkuji samozřejmě Kaviaru, který nám poskytl prostor, stejně tak Šanty, kteří tady tohle všechno umožnili. Tak a bez nějakých větších odkladů, myslím, že se do toho můžeme pustit. So, welcome. Thank My you. friend, uh, I'm glad that you came. So, uh, have you ever been to Prague I or have, Czech yeah. Republic? I have, yeah. But uh, before that, I just I wanted to first of all thank you. I want to thank uh, oh, yeah. Shanti and uh, you know Libor, uh, Peter, Adam, everybody at Shanti and Caviar for hosting, uh, uh, Radim and and Bayer for preparing the hookahs and the tea and everything. So I'm I'm really grateful. Um, I have been to Prague. This is I think my fifth or sixth time here. Sixth time? Yeah. Uh, why we didn't hear about you? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I never even thought that uh, this was a possibility. If so I we were just here sure, I mean, drinking beer, enjoying our culture and the view? Uh, for sure, some of that. Uh, we also manufacture glass here. Obviously, you guys have the best glass in the world. The Bohemian uh, glass crystal is famous. And so we, I come here to visit one of our factories. Um, and also, uh, for me, I, I love the city. I think you guys have a beautiful city in Prague, and the country is incredible. I've, I've driven through it a lot and uh, received many speeding tickets from your <laughs> cameras, so uh, I have a lot of uh, evidence that I. So you're a nasty driver. Not a nasty driver. I just I, when there's a, nobody on the road and it's easy, and you have a Škoda that's automatic manual <laughs> transmission. Yeah, I'm going to take it. <laughs> okay, and. How are you? What did you uh, have for dinner? I haven't had dinner actually. Yeah. Oh, so this is my dinner right now—the matcha <laughs> and the rooibos. The tea. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I just—I uh, recently described you in Czech. 
so please uh, introduce... I, I understood when you said cut the bullshit, so yeah, I hope that was... Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll make sure to cut so the bullshit. So please introduce yourself to our audience. Who are you, Reza? I mean, that's a very deep philosophical question, but my name is Reza Bavar. I'm the founder of Cloud. I founded it in uh, 2010. Initially, when we founded it, the company was called Sparks. Sparks was a very, very bad name. And in 2011, we renamed the company Cloud. Cloud is a fusion of, of in, in India, one of the dialects, the word for art is Kala, and the English word cloud. So it means art of cloud. When you put the two words together, it means art of cloud. Is the Indian culture something special for you? You know, I, I studied uh, anthropology uh, for my undergraduate, for my bachelor's degree. And uh, so culture in general is, is very special to me. I love being in culture, learning from the people inside the culture. Uh, and yeah, of course, Indian culture is very ancient. And as far as I know, that's where uh, the hookah culture began. You're right. But you know, it's a legend, a myth. But tell me something about your past before the hookah business. Uh, I've read somewhere that you were on some entrepreneurs forum. You are a co-author co of some kind of book. Uh, I think it's a uh, way to success or something like that. So please just uh, tell me something about your past, your journey before hookah. Yeah, uh, so I, I belong to an organization. It's a global organization. There's a chapter in Czech as well called the Entrepreneurs Organization. And uh, it's, it's basically a place where entrepreneurs can come together and learn from each other um, and connect. Uh, not networking is not the right way to approach it because they actually don't want you to network. It's more about uh, connecting and uh, sharing the entrepreneurial spirit because uh, I think everybody is an entrepreneur deep down inside. And uh, the people that, are, that express it, that go after the entrepreneurship, it's almost like a fire. And so the more fire you have around, the more bright the flame will, will glow. Um, the book that you're talking about is called Turning Risk into Reward. Uh, and that's really what entrepreneurship is about. It's, being willing to take the risk, which is very scary, um, I know, <laughs> uh, but there are rewards. And it's not, at least for me, I don't think it's about the money. It's about the ability to create. I think that's more important than anything for me. And most of the very, very good entrepreneurs that I know, I think that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So you were really into entrepreneurship, but what was your first company, like a real project? Uh, I, I think uh, that... Uh, the forum is real, but your own, your own business. What was your first yeah, own business? Uh, so my, my first business actually was when I was very young. I would buy newspapers and then sell them to people in my neighborhood. So post boy. <laughs> Newspaper boy, yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, uh, I think 12 years old when I was doing that one. Um, but my, my first real business was a company, was a graphic design uh, and advertising company called Imagination Graphics. Mm -hmm. um, and I founded that when I was 19. I was in college. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. I, I taught myself how to do Photoshop. And at that time, we were From using... From YouTube, right? <laughs> no, there was no YouTube at that time. Oh. The, the internet was new. No, there was no YouTube either. <laughs> OK, it's like 20 uh, years ago. And so I, I would learn from other people and then just play with it, you know, and experiment. It's kind of like with hookah, even. You know, I experiment so until I find... Pushing the boundaries. It. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was a great business. Uh, but then I... I was pressured by my family that, you know, this is not the right business. You have to go to law school. And I talked to one of the young men here in the audience and Do I told a real him, don't go to, don't go to law school. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I went to law school and I became a lawyer. And uh, from, uh, based on your education, that's why your, for example, products are uh, really, are under a lot of patents. Yeah, I, I, I realized the value and the importance of protecting authentic intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Talking about intellectual property, mm -hmm. let's uh, continue to the story of Cloud, mm -hmm. the Cloud Lotus, your D product that started the HMD industry. Mm -hmm. So what's the story behind Cloud Lotus? You said that you... In 2012, you launched Cloud. 2010. 2010, but in 2012, you launched Cloud Lotus. Yeah, that's right. In so what was the journey? So our first product uh, that we sold in the market was a product called Cloud Pure. It was a flavor and filtration enhancer. Powder. Yeah, powder. 
uh, and you would put it in the water and it would add flavor and then also it would take out some of the, the things inside the smoke. And so when you were done, you would see these little like, I don't know, they almost look like uh, little tea leaves floating inside the water. Um, I saw your first instructional videos <laughs> yeah. on your YouTube site. So that was our first product. Um, but the whole time, the reason I founded Cloud was to make smoking as harmless as possible. Not healthy, healthy is the wrong word. But we can make it uh, less harmful or safer. Mm -hmm. And so we began working on, or I began working on an uh, electric head uh, to allow people to smoke using electricity instead of uh, charcoal because maybe the worst thing in, in the smoke is actually what's coming from the charcoal, even the coconut charcoal. And to why uh, the first Lotus wasn't electrical? So at that time, the technology didn't allow us to do what we needed to do. It would become, it was going to be something very, very big and that you were going to have to plug in. And we still know right now the battery is not strong enough, so we would still need to plug it in. Mm -hmm. But the technology is smaller. There's Bluetooth technology now that wasn't around then. There's Wi-Fi technology now that wasn't around then. There are sensors. All the technology has grown and now would be the, the right time for a electric Lotus. So it's possible? Completely possible, yes. I've smoked it, yes. <laughs> yeah, we have also a Czech project called Monk. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's possible. So uh, let's uh, go back to Cloud Lotus. So in 2012 you launched it. How many years or months uh, did it take to develop? Yeah, it, it took about one year to develop the Lotus. Um, and it was a very, we were, at that time, we were looking at using other heating methods, even other than electricity, and we saw that none of these were going to work well, and I had understood that we could do something with charcoal, but I was resisting doing it because I know that charcoal is, is one of the things that is not good for people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then when we realized we couldn't do anything else, we knew that at the very least we could make it... Let's make it healthier. He less harmful, yeah. Less harmful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, use the proper words. Yeah. So when did you realize you made a revolutionary product? The market for, for sent it to you or you... No, for me when, when I first smoked it uh, with my team at that time, uh, we were blown away. I mean, like we tested it with, at that time there was something called the fl hookah flip. I don't know if you remember Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, the dragon. Yeah, the dragon, that's right. Um, and we tested it against that because for me that was better than just regular foil mm -hmm. on the, the, the bowl. Um, and it was much better immediately. We knew that it was much better and so we knew that it was definitely a better product than anything else that we could find on the market. And at that time, you know, we looked to see what else was in the market and there was no such thing as a heat management device. And actually, I created the, the word heat management device or heat management system because... Yeah, we use heat management system in Czech Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I would go to sell the product, they would say, oh, that's a wind cover and uh, 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 a wind cover. And, I and say, you were no. like, no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to explain it to them. So I had to create new language to explain what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, why uh, was the first Lotus shaped like that, like we all uh, know it? I mean, a lot of that is, is the function, right? So we knew that we wanted walls so that the charcoal would stay on it because it couldn't just be a flat uh, surface. And we knew that the lid was very helpful because it's like an oven mm -hmm. or a stove, right? When you're cooking, you can turn the heat up and down. And so we wanted to make sure that we gave people the opportunity to regulate their temperature because everybody... To manage the heat. To manage the heat because everybody likes their tobacco at a different temperature, slightly different temperature, in the same way that everybody likes, for example, their steak, or if you don't eat steak, maybe your eggplant in a very different you know, kind of consistency. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly summarize the pros and cons of the Cloud Lotus system uh, against the foil? Oh yeah, no, we actually, I mean, we even did lab testing, so we know what the pros and cons are. The pros are that it eliminates significantly the you know, volatile organic compounds. So um, if you think about something like benzene, that's one of the volatile organic compounds. And benzene is toxic. Or toluene, which is a carcinogen. It reduces them by like 98% or 85% um, when you're using the chrysalis. Um, it reduces uh, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are all carcinogens, by like 95%. Um, it reduces the... Uh, High chemistry here. <laughs> 
Yeah, carbon monoxide, which is why some people will feel sick or get a headache. It's from the carbon monoxide normally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it reduces, what's the other one? Uh, carbonyl compounds, which are uh, harmful to human beings. So we know that the lotus, and especially when you're using it with the chrysalis, has a significant impact on the quality of the smoke. Mm -hmm. We try to learn people how heat waves flows through the bowl. Uh, tell me what's your opinion on that. How, in your opinion, the heat waves flows through the bowl? Yeah, so there, there are really two ways that you can smoke. One of them is what we call conduction. Conduction is when there's contact, okay? And the other one is convection. So conduction would be like a stove. Convection would be like an oven. And the lotus is meant to use convection, meaning that it's the hot air, the super hot air, that passes into the tobacco that will give you the cleanest, uh, least harmful smoke. When you put the tobacco right on the base of the lotus, which for those of you that do it, you know it's very hard to clean because we didn't design it to be like that. Uh, when you do that, you will get a lot of smoke in the beginning, but then it's like... Uh, It's like very cheap gum, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it tastes good maybe for the first four or five puffs. So for like one minute, and then after that it tastes like shit. So why so many people, for example, in Czech Republic, uh, smoke uh, with lotus touching the tobacco? Is it the wrong way? Is it the right way? What's your opinion? Because my, it, it, we have so many people who are doing that and they are satisfied with the smoke, with the outcome of smoke, of flavor, strength. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> For me, my opinion is that definitely convection is the correct way. And I think they're doing it because that's the way they learned to do it in the beginning. And so we're human beings. And when we learn to do something, we, it's a habit. And so we don't really want to change it if it's working. You know, in the United States, we have a saying, if it's not broke, why fix it? And we would say that it is broken and you should fix it. But, you know, people have to decide what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And have you adapted your product to the market or the market uh, adjust their bowls and accessories to your product? Because uh, I think uh, at the beginning there were not so many bowls uh, where cloud loaders fitted. So we, we looked at that time the bowl that we adapted our product to was Hookah John's Harmony Bowl. Um, and I told my team, I said, I know that it is a success when other companies that are making bowls make bowls to fit the Lotus, which now I think 90% of the bowls in the market are made to fit the Lotus. Um, of course, there are other bowls that they're made for foil and things like that that are much smaller, uh, but almost every bowl that's in the market will fit the Lotus. Mm -hmm. And what kind, what kind of feedback have you received from the US community since the beginning? Oh, they love it. Yeah, I mean, the first people that got our product were... Um, Smoker Pass? Smoker Pass was one of them. Another one was Dragonfly Mike. Um, there, were, there were these very, very early hookah bloggers. Uh, and they were blogging about hookah at a time when there was no heat management device. And so you can imagine what their, their, most of their blogs were talking about the flavors in tobacco. Because at that time, there was no real technology in hookah yet. There were some companies that were trying small things here and there, like you know the plastic diffuser that you would add, attach to the bottom of the stem, or um, yeah, base, or maybe disposable hoses. But there was nothing really revolutionary in the market yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, you made a revolutionary product, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, guys in the U.S. smoke uh, with Provost. Uh, is Provost something different than Cloud Lotus, or it works? Uh, Mm, simply the same, in your it, opinion. I think it is a different experience. I think the, the Provost experience uh, delivers much more direct heat. And I think most of the people that are smoking with Provost, they smoke foil with a bowl, and they want really high heat to their tobacco. Um, the Lotus can achieve the same, and I believe better results. But I think a lot of the times in the hookah community, we are learning from each other. And so if somebody that you respect tells you that this is the better way, you will just try it, and maybe that will be the method that you will adopt, but it might not necessarily be the best method. Was there somebody who, like, generally hate your product? We know, uh, we, in Czech Republic, yes, we, we know Sarkis, for example. Yeah, I think that there are, I think, you know, a lot of people, um, they hate 
our product or they hate cloud because of the way that we um, behave in the community, in the market. Um, and basically, I think some of the people are looking for us to uh, give them a platform, to give them a voice, to make them kind of like a superstar. And we're not interested in that. We're interested in the, the product. We're interested in the experience that the community can have. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes for personal reasons, they will tell lies about the company. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So right now we are smoking from Cloud Lotus Free. In which ways Cloud Lotus Free is different or improved uh, compared with the original Cloud Lotus? I think the Lotus 3 is the best HMD in the world right now. I th um, but it's 10 years, 10 yeah. years gap. So yeah, yeah. what's we different? What we did was we, we basically had the Lotus 1 Plus and the Lotus 2 make a baby, and that's the Lotus 3. And the reason that it's better is because, number one, the, the ash will not go into the tobacco, or it should not go into the tobacco. Uh, and for those of you that smoke a lot, you know that when the ash starts to go into the tobacco, you're not just heating the tobacco anymore, you're also heating the ash, which is not a good thing. Um, and so it will, it will affect the flavor, and some of the ash will actually go into the smoke. Um, so it's, it's cooking the tobacco as opposed to burning it completely. I mean, it's just completely cooking the tobacco. We also brought the base up to make it very hard to make contact because as you can see right now, we're not making contact. Um, and it will produce very rich, very thick smoke that tastes fantastic and that, you know, the other day I was uh, with my team and we smoked for about three and a half hours off the same bowl. So it was great all the way through. Nobody had a headache. Nobody felt sick. It was a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the claim of your company. Born in the heart of a baby unicorn. Why did you choose unicorns? Yeah, so uh, at that time, uh, you know, we, like Apple, was doing this thing where they would say, you know, designed in Cupertino and manufactured in China. Manufactured in China or made in China. And so... I didn't want to just copy Apple. I, a lot of people say that we copy Apple. I don't think we do. I think we do what we do, and it happens to sometimes cop, you know, be similar to what they're doing. But I wanted it to be a little bit playful, mm -hmm. you know, because who cares? You know, at the end of the day, we said it's designed in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, designed with love in the heart of a baby unicorn. Instead of saying designed in Los Angeles, we said designed with love in the heart of a baby unicorn because a baby unicorn is magic and cute. <laughs> you mentioned manufacturing. In which countries worldwide do you manufacture your products? So right now we manufacture... Uh, originally the first Lotus was manufactured exclusively in the United States. And then we moved our manufacturing of the Lotus to China. Uh, we manufacture obviously glass in Czech. We manufacture components in Italy and in the Netherlands as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people love uh, the original Cloud Lotus 1 uh, and uh, tells me that uh, the Cloud Lotus 1 Plus it's uh, some kind of different. The second and the third version are really different. So why not come back to your original idea and make, for example, a revival of the former Cloud Lotus? You know, if the market demands it, for example. Yeah, and we may at some point do a limited edition because the first Lotus, it came in a wood box. I don't know if you ever saw that one. I think not. It came in a wood box and uh, uh, it was really beautiful. I mean, it was a big wood box and the Lotus was in there with foam. And we may do something like that because a, a lot of the Lotuses now are kind of collector's items. Um, but I know that my goal is to provide the best product to the community. And the best product is the Lotus 3. So going back, it would be giving somebody a less effective product uh, for nostalgia. But we wouldn't look at it as, OK, this is the better product. So in our current optics, the original Cloud Lotus is not as good as Cloud Lotus 3? According to our, my opinion and the beta testing that we do, so we set up a, a blind wall, and we have people test the, just their smoking from the hose. Mm. That's it. And based on that, we know that the Lotus 3 is the one that people prefer. Okay, let's get back to your company. Yeah. Uh, what challenges have you had to face when building Cloud back in the 2010? Yeah, so many. I mean, like development was the biggest one at that time because I didn't know how to make a product at that time. I didn't understand how hard it is to, 
sit down and take something that I have as an idea and then take it to designers and engineers and help them to create it. And then once they're done, to test it, we know getting prototypes and all these things, and then testing the prototypes multiple rounds. I think with the Lotus, the initial Lotus, we had like eight different prototypes that we tested. Um, and then going into manufacturing, which at that time I had never manufactured before. Mm -hmm. And the manufacturers, uh, they're not always kind to people who have never manufactured before. And so number one, finding the factory and then trying not to get taken advantage of by the factory was a big challenge. Um, and then finding distribution. So bringing the product into the world uh, was also very difficult to get people to trust us because in the beginning, with the Lotus, when, when people would test it, maybe they would not use it the correct way. They would use it like foil, uh, charcoal with foil. And so they would call, and I would pick up the phone, and they would start yelling at me, telling me I had... You were the hotline. I'm, I'm still the hotline, yeah. <laughs> and people would get you know very angry, and they would say, you guys are bullshit, and you're ripping us off, and all these other things. And then I would walk them through and explain how to use the product. And then they would call back and say, this is amazing. I'm very happy. And so it was word of mouth. Uh, in the forums and in the communities that eventually got us uh, to the place that we are. So you mentioned your, the process. What is the cloud process of making things? What's the first step and what's uh, the other steps? The, the, we have a mission, which is uh, to transform the world one puff at a time. And that means that we need to create products that are pleasing not just to look at, but to use. It should work really well, but also be very beautiful. And so we start there, at, meaning that's the minimum. And we then look and say, okay, what are the things that we feel are missing in the market? How can we improve on what's in the market mm -hmm. right now? And we work backwards from that. Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, that it should look good. Uh, your packages right here are simply beautiful. So uh, this is one of the ways how to uh, pr promote or okay. no, Im improve uh, the culture of uh, packaging in a hookah business. Because yeah, uh, last years uh, we got a lot of nice packages uh, on hookahs, on bowls, etc. But I think you were the one of the first guys who even think about the package. Yeah. Uh, we were very thoughtful when it comes to the packaging uh, for, uh, because if somebody is going to spend money on a product, we want them to enjoy every experience that they have with the product. That means mm -hmm. from the moment that they take it in their hands all the way to the moment that they use it for the first time, we want it to be a flawless, perfect experience. And also I believe in the deep power of beauty. Right? Beauty can make people uh, very emotional. And I think that it's operating in a very deep way. It's affecting people. And so mm -hmm. we want it to be beautiful all the way through. Sounds nice. What about foreign markets? When did you enter your first foreign market? And uh, did you, uh, do you remember some bizarres or specifics? Yeah, uh, we entered the foreign market pretty quickly. I mean, because the, the hookah community, we can't advertise. And so most of the people are, are learning from the bloggers or they're learning from the forums. And so it's, a, it's usually global. It's multinational. People are from all over the world engaging with each other, talking to each other, visiting each other. And the American community talked about the product. And then very quickly we had people from Germany, Hungary, France uh, that ordered the product and took it over. And they loved it and they continued to order more. So your first market was France, I think? Our first market outside of the US um, was either France or Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did uh, people receive uh, some kind of improvement? It was like, yeah, we used the foil and now there is something, uh, a metal box called Cloud Loudus. Um, most people really loved it. I would say like 95% of people loved it. Some people were like, no, I still prefer foil. And some people were, you know, telling us that aluminum foil is toxic or aluminum is toxic. And, you know, that's not true. <laughs> I think uh, first, uh, uh, at first, uh, your products came in Czech Republic at 2014. And from that time, uh, you broke it all. Uh, Everybody is using HMDs, Lotuses or some uh, copies or licensed products. Uh, you really changed the game. Uh, how do you feel about it? 
I feel great. Are I mean, you cocky or not? I hope I'm not cocky. I'm very grateful. <laughs> I mean, because I think for people to trust the brand, I think we are a trusted brand. In general, a lot of the times when we put products into the market, people will buy it without anybody telling them that it's good or bad. They just, they know that cloud believes in the product and backs the product. And so they will buy the product and if there's a problem, we help them to fix it. And if we can't help them to fix it, we take it back. Yeah, for example, in the Russian market, they don't call it Lotus, it's called Clouds. So your company name is really spelled there. So let's talk about design. What are the key components of uh, your products? I mean, uh, look can be deceiving, so uh, tell me about your design. Um, so are you asking like the design why we design the way the design language of your products because yeah we were talk talking about packages but uh, we see the blobs a smaller one a bigger one and then uh, these kind of lotus yeah. flowers so. yeah 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 so um, the original lotus if you look at the lid it's kind of like an abstract representation of a lotus leaf okay and then same thing with the lotus too. It's like if you look at, a, at the lotus bulb before it blossoms into a flower, it looks kind of like the lotus too. And the same thing we wanted to do with the lotus three. And the handles on the lotus three are meant to be, I don't know if you know what an astrolabe is. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a scientific device that they use for navigation in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so we use that as a kind of inspiration. And the dome on the calyx, for example, or on the, on the excuse me, on the Eltheria or on the Monarch, it's inspired by architecture. Because if you see a lot of really incredible buildings, whether it's you know, um, uh, the Vatican or uh, a lot of these other really extraordinary buildings around the world, they use domes. And the dome for us has significant Like the church, meaning. the temple. Church, temple, mosque, whatever. They use domes. And we love uh, incorporating the dome. Even the calyx, to a certain extent, is a dome. Uh, and then these features on the side are really kind of inspired by this beautiful work that they do with uh, mirrors. And then on the calyx, for example, we these features on the side, yeah, they add texture so that it makes it easier to hold, but then also it's supposed to be like wind going over sand dunes. Mm -hmm. So we, we You're try- You're in touch with, in, with nature. We're, we're in touch with architecture and nature and how these two are interacting with each other. Um, and then if you look on the inside of the samsaras, it's supposed to be a visual representation of a Hindu. In, Hindu. in the Hindu religion, they have something called samsara, which is the cycle of birth, life, and death. And then you come back in reincarnation, and you go again and again, and that's a spiral. And the spiral is, is telling a story, and the story that the spiral is telling is that you're not on a flat disk just going around in circles, which life can sometimes feel like. You're actually climbing a staircase, in a spiral staircase. You're moving up, always. Every human being is moving up. You're learning and you're, you're seeing things from a different perspective. So that if you have the same kind of experience, maybe because you've grown, you will experience it in a different way, mm -hmm. or you will see it in a different way. You were pointing on the Alteria. So uh, you did tell me that you're in touch in architecture, nature. So why uh, do you use silicon? Why do we use silicon? Yeah, yeah. Why uh, the Alteria and the uh, Calyx is made from silicon? Yeah, so we use silicone because silicone is a very durable material. It's easy to clean, it lasts a very, very long time. Um, and we use plastic because it's very difficult to break the plastic. I know that one of my experiences owning God knows how many hookahs in my lifetime, maybe 80 or 100, is that many of them would break at some point. And I was always very frustrated because I would spend money and then maybe after one use sometimes it would break. <laughs> and I felt very bad about this. And so we wanted to give value to people and say, look, we are using a process and a plastic that actually costs us more than glass would have cost us. But at the end of the day, it's going to last longer. And so in the future, even if we make versions of the Eltheria that are going to be using glass, the plastic will always be there as a backup. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, our hookah marketing is uh, hard to do, so please tell me who is your customer and what's your marketing practices towards them? Yeah, so uh, we're, our audience or our target is everybody in this audience right now. And we, we see people who are 
number one, they have a sense of adventure, right? Like they, they love being in the world. They want to explore the world. They want to learn about the world. That's one of the key uh, elements. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is that they are focused on community. Normally, people aren't smoking hookah alone, or if they are, they're you know, maybe even playing on a, a video game and they're on a headset talking to people. So it's a very community-driven uh, experience. Um, and then we also want people that are paying attention to design, that they will look at a product and say, OK, this allows me to put this on my table at home and leave it there, and I don't need to move it. And it, even if I'm not smoking it, it's still doing something, which is adding to the beauty of my space. Mm -hmm. So do you work with your customers' feedback? Uh, do you produce customer-oriented products? Yes. Uh, we, we're always listening to the market. Um, one of the things that we heard when the Lotus 2 came out was that, look, it's not working with a lot of the bowls. We heard this very loud. <laughs> um, and so we understood that, OK, we made a mistake with that. And uh, so we're always looking to see how we can correct mistakes, make the product better, or even from our own testing, how we can improve upon what's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, can you remember some uh, kind of uh, original feedback? On which product? For example, the Lotus or Alfiria. Yeah, so on the Lotus, one of the pieces of original feedback that we got that we didn't implement until the Lotus 3 was that they wanted, uh, you guys wanted a, a handle on the base mm -hmm. so that you could easily lift it up and take it to the side. And we tried to do that with the Lotus 2 with the key, but people would lose the key or they just, yeah. they didn't want to use it. It was just a pain in the ass. And so with the Lotus 3, our approach was, okay, we will fix it. We will make a handle that people are still able to touch but that um, is still beautiful because most of the handles that other counterfeits or copies put into the product are, in my opinion, very ugly. They ruin the symmetry of the product. Um, and so that, that's one of the pieces. And we spent on the handle, believe it or not, about four or five months mm -hmm. understanding the best way to make the handle using the correct kind of material so that it wouldn't melt, it wouldn't burn the hand, all these types of things. Mm -hmm. Speaking of feedback, what's your, or just uh, describe your attitude to uh, your domestic community or uh, the worldwide hookah community? Are you active in some kind of forums, groups? Do you provide answers? And uh, do the people treat you well or treat you like, huh, you made some kind of bullshit that is overpriced? Just describe your attitude. I, I'm not very active on the forums myself um, because a lot of the times the forums are not helpful is the best way to put it. It's, you mean toxic? They can be toxic. I think they're getting much better now. I think there are some forums that the people inside of the forum revolted against the forum and they created their own forums because they saw that the forum really became uh, about vanity, right? There were four or five people that became very popular and then they would, they became kind of like little mini dictators. And that's not what the hookah community is about. That's not what a forum should be about. You're literally speaking about Sarkis. For, for us, it's important that the forum is a place where it's almost, it's taking the culture of hookah, which for me, when I discovered it in 2000, when one, it was about connecting and meeting a stranger and sharing a, a smoke with that person and becoming friends with the person. And that's what the forum should ideally be. It shouldn't be oh, you're full of shit, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about, these types mm -hmm. of things, it's not helpful. And that's, unfortunately, look, most of the world is like that right now, and we're seeing the, the poison that that's injected into society. Okay. Uh, tell me, please, more about your cloud universe, about your products. Uh, what products or projects have won or lost the market since the beginning? Um, I think definitely the, the Lotuses have done very well in the market. Um, I think the... The Chrysalis line is gaining more and more popularity. We started with the Chrysalis Monarch, which is very expensive, and most people honestly It's made can't. of marble, I think. There's marble, there's real wood. It's made in Italy, so it's a very expensive product for us to make. Mm -hmm. But then it's also a very expensive product for people to buy. But we had to start with that product because that was the first one that we developed. And then we introduced the Eltheria, which is much more affordable because it's in the same price range as some of the higher end um, products out there like Stimulation or Wuka or um, some of these other hookah products that are out there. 
Medus. Medus. Uh, and the Calyx is really, for us right now, it's the entry point to the Chrysalis line. And it's also, for me, the one that I travel with. I mean, like, I've been traveling throughout Europe now for almost two weeks. And I put it in my suitcase. It breaks down. You know, you can break everything apart. It becomes a flat line in a suitcase. Uh -huh. You put clothes underneath and on top of it. It's fantastic. It's very easy to move around with. So and you then, can fit it to your backpack. Yeah, yeah. You saw me with the back. Yeah. And then when you have it, you just carry it around like this. So we made the Calyx. We call it the portable of adventure buddy <laughs> or sidekick. And what we're saying to the market is... Take this to the beach, take this to the pool, take this to the to camping, take this wherever you're going to go, it can go with you. Mm -hmm. And because it's plastic and steel and really excellent uh, silicone, it's very hard to damage. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about your SAM series bowls. When, it, uh, when you were speaking of the breakthrough of forums and how people uh, do a revolt and make their own groups, we had... Uh, a little discussion back in 2014 because uh, first of your some services uh, came by but uh, they were fakes and some guy in a community ed educates them that uh, they are proper ones not fakes no, no, okay. and that's why we started a Czech hookah community group so uh, it was a blast in the past so tell me more about the some service bowls because it, I think it was your second successful product. Yeah, so the, the first that Samsaris like that we put in the market was uh, all silicone. And it was a great product, but w again, we were listening to the community. And what was happening was that people were using some very strong flavors, like double apple or grape, and it would ghost Ghosting. the bowl. Yeah. yeah, it would ghost the bowl. And that's a real problem because uh, ghosting is almost like smelly shoes, you know? It's very hard to clean. <laughs> so. We decided that no, we need to look at other options and we went to glass. And when we went to glass, we saw that no, the glass was cracking or breaking because we were using different manufacturing techniques and most of the manufacturers we're working with were not using high heat and also, or we're not preparing products for very high heat. And also um, the shape of the samsaras is very hard for a factory to do in general mm -hmm. and to make it last. Uh, and so we made the decision internally that we would 100% back those products, meaning if the glass broke, we would just send a free uh, replacement mm -hmm. to the people. And then over time, our manufacturing process improved. We learned from our mistakes, and we made now glass that should not break. Speaking about uh, the spiral there, uh, was it just a uh, look? Or, uh, describing the samsara circle or uh, it was meant to be some kind of better uh, heat circulating uh, shape? Yeah, so uh, my opinion is that yes, for sure there's the, the kind of deeper mystical meaning of the, of the spiral, which is great, but then also the functionality of it was there was a few reasons for it. One was that people could measure out each flavor that they wanted to put. So when I would go to a... For mixology. For mixology, exactly. So when I would go to a hookah lounge, I would tell them that I want you to do three blades of mint, three blades of uh, orange, for example, and two blades citrus. of... Citrus, <laughs> your citrus. favorite. I love citrus, yeah. And two blades of grape, for example. And then it was very easy for them to measure and mix. Um, we, when we created the new version of the samsaris, we added even more blades. And what I believe that's doing is that there are these sharp points. But it's flatter. It's flatter, but there are still the sharp points. And those sharp points become radiation points that reflect. Heat is a wave. And so any wave will respond to a surface. And so those sharp points are reflecting more and more of the heat back up. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting the tobacco to cook from the top and the bottom, like a very good oven. OK. Please tell me more about your filters. I think it's called uh, Ira or something like that. Ayara, yeah. Ayara, Aya, Aya. okay. And Sorry. recently uh, you put out some kind of study mm -hmm. about the filters. So uh, introduce your filters and tell me more about the study, please. Yeah, so we, we wanted to introduce a product, a uh, carbon filter. So those of you that use carbon filters like in an air filtration system at your house, you understand that it's doing something. And what it's doing is it's pulling things out of the air that are binding to the carbon, okay? And we know that it's doing the same thing with the smoke. 
So normally when people are smoking with the filter, the first thing they will identify is that the smoke tastes much cleaner. And then over time, it becomes very difficult for them to smoke without the filter because once you taste very clean smoke, it's very hard to go back to what the smoke was like before. So you can feel the effect, in your opinion? 100%. Um, and for me, it's the same experience when I use, for example, a Lotus 1, Lotus 2, or a Lotus 3. I only smoke with the Lotus 3 now because I don't like the experience with the Lotus 1 anymore. And uh, you made your, uh, your study in Germany, and what's the outcome? So the, the, yes, we used a lab in Germany, and the way that we set up the test was that we set up just a regular hookah with foil mm -hmm. and charcoal, and we used that as what we would call the baseline. So those of you that are in science, you understand that the baseline is telling you what the world is like right now, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we did another test where we used the Lotus, the Samsaris, and the IRA filter, and we looked at what was happening when people are using it like that, and we saw a significant decrease, like 80 plus percent across the board, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of carbon monoxide, which I think was like 65 percent. The study is on our website. Um, and then we tested the chrysalis system, this one right here, and what we saw was 90 percent plus. So with the volatile organic compounds, I think it was 85 percent with the um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAH, and with the carbonyl compounds, it was like 95% plus, and in some cases, completely eliminating the compound. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, in, in, on average, in the whole family, it's 95% plus, but some of them are 100% gone. They're not detected by the machine mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and then with the carbon monoxide, I think it's about 65%. That sounds nice. Right now, I will name uh, some of your products, and uh, please, you will describe it. So what's Citra? Citra is a thermal diffuser, and we have... We have it the, here? Yeah, in the same way that we have uh, three different uh, kinds of bowls. The Citra uh, stars is what we call them, and the word is, it comes from the word for star in Farsi, which is my, my mother tongue is Farsi, I'm from Iran. And the word for star is setare, so we, we say Citra. And what it's doing is that when you put this into the samsaris and then you pack the tobacco, number one, it's blocking the tobacco from falling through. And if it does fall through, it will be underneath the bowl when you're done and you can put it back in. Um, but then it takes the heat and it transfers the heat into the body of the tobacco, which normally when you're smoking, the heat is coming from the top and then slowly it will radiate through. And so because you are using a citra, you will get more flavor and better clouds. So it's another heating and device. And use less charcoal, yes. It's another, mm -hmm. it's another component in the heat management system. Mm -hmm. What's Aeolus? Aeolus is our hoses. And uh, it comes from the name of two gods, actually. One is the, the god of uh, the dawn. So the, when the sun rises, mm -hmm. there's a god as attached to that. And the god, goddess of wind. Okay, and so if they had a baby, the goddess of wind and the god of dawn, it would be the, the Aeolus, which is basically the, the breeze in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, Which for those of you that wake up early in the morning, you know it's fantastic, it's very clean, very nice. <laughs> in which ways are your hoses different? So we use platinum cured silicone, uh, which means that it's antifungal and antibacterial. It means that mm -hmm. bacteria and fungus cannot grow, it's medical grade. It would be something they would use normally in a hospital. Um, we use stainless steel parts so that it, it will last forever. Um, and then we deliberately made the wood so that it rotates. And it, because it rotates, when you're passing it, it doesn't kink up, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know. Make a disaster. Make a knot, yeah, because <laughs> it will happen, right? Okay, tell me about the word Vestara. So Vestara is from the Italian word for volcano. It originates mm -hmm. from that. Um, and so we wanted to make tongs. You know, these tongs are nice, they're functional, but we wanted to make tongs that were really engineered. And so the Vestara has, I think, like something like 30 parts on the inside. There's the spire. A, the, yeah, there's a spring mechanism, but there's all these kind of gears and bearings and all these other things that make it a very smooth action. And so with the Vestara, you would press it, and then it will obviously open just like these. Um, but it's a, it's a much 
cleaner action. You don't, like with this, I have to apply more and more pressure. Mm -hmm. And so if you're picking up a piece of charcoal, you might have to, sometimes you will break the charcoal. Okay, let's make a smart move. What's Celestia? So Celestia is our first uh, electronic product, and it is a uh, Bluetooth-enabled app-driven LED device that also has a pressure sensor. Um, we're actually the first company that, that incorporated a pressure sensor in an LED device. You're not. <coughs> oh, no, no, we are. Believe me, we are. <laughs> I, I can promise you that we are. Uh, but we can talk later. We will talk later, yeah. Um, and Libor and I can talk later too. We'll yeah, talk yeah. Later. But uh, the Vestara, when you smoke from it, I think there should be a, uh, excuse me, a, a Celestia. Is there a Celestia in this one? Or I no? think uh, there is a Celestia, but it's not powered up. Let's turn it on. Yeah, there it is. So this is my travel uh, calyx right here. And you turn on the Celestia. And you can just press the button if you want, and it will change the colors. Mm -hmm. And you put it back in. And it, it will react. It adds ambiance. So now if you take a puff, you should see it become brighter. Yeah, so it will actually, bit. we call it the breathing light, because what it's doing is that it is actually the pressure sensor is responding to the change in pressure, and it will make it brighter. So if you think about if you've ever sat by a fire and blown into the fire, especially if you're doing like a barbecue, you will see the coal become brighter. And so that was the inspiration behind the Vestara. And then if I connect it using the app, so we developed an app that allows you to connect your phone whether it's an Android or an iPhone, to the Celestia. And then you can adjust the brightness, or you can change the colors. So right now, it's on a setting that we call Asgard. So each one of the moods has a name that we pulled from science fiction fantasy, because mm -hmm. I love science fiction fantasy. I think it, it brings <laughs> really great things to the world. A lot of inspiration. So those of you that, that know Thor, you know Asgard. Um, the next one is Atlantis. I think everybody here knows Atlantis. Uh, the next one is Narnia. Everybody, I think, knows Narnia, Chronicles of Narnia. There is winter in Narnia? Narnia, for sure, yeah. When they, oh, first, okay. go into, when they first go in, it's all winter. Okay, right? I'm not arguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then there's Barsoom, which is Mars from, uh, I forget the name of the uh, book. Then there's the Shire, uh, because I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, then there's Shangri-La, which is a kind of, uh, it's a mystical uh, paradise in the Himalayas. Um, and then, so we can make it brighter. And because I'm, I'm here with Jacob, I can set a timer that will tell me when it's time for Jacob to pass the hose back to me. I won't pass you the hose. So <laughs> you have your own in, in a few seconds, you'll see what happens when the timer reaches the, the point where it's time for Jacob okay. to pass. Five, and you, four, three, three two, two, one. And then it starts blinking red. Exactly, and he'll ignore it and distract you so that he can keep smoking. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the introduction yep. to your smart light. What's Altaris? So Altaris is, it comes from the word altar, okay? And the altar is a place that you place things that are, that are sacred. And the Altaris is a place for you, you to, we have one version that's for the standard hookah, that's, you know, wood and solid aluminum. It's a very, very strong product. The bearings that we use on that can take like, you know, maybe 1,000 kilos. So it's a little bit more than probably what most people's hookahs will be. But it allows it to rotate because... So I can sit on Altaris and then rotate? You could stand on the Altaris and rotate, yeah. yeah. Why didn't you uh, bring some kind of uh, gimmick? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it could be it, nice. it's very heavy, that's why. It's a, it's a very heavy product. And then we made an Altaris as well for the Altheria that doesn't have the wood. Uh, because it doesn't need it. The Altaris that has the wood, it, it has a chamber underneath that you can put up to three Celestia, and so it illuminates your hookah from underneath. Okay, uh, let's move to another topic. Uh, let's talk about the intellectual property. Uh, the patents issued to Cloud works almost all around the world. Please describe your philosophy behind the patents and tell me more about, tell me more about fighting the counterfeits. Yeah, so... Um, I b I'm a big believer in the philosophy that the people that invent something should be the ones that can benefit from it, okay? 
And we filed our patents around the world to protect ourselves because if we didn't, we would be put in a position where the cheap counterfeits that are coming in from wherever, from China or from Russia or whatever, can very easily come into the market and kill the company. And so we wanted to be able to protect the company so that we could continue to obviously make money and develop all the other products that we, we work hard to develop. Mm -hmm. How much money did you spend on it? On just the I know patents? The pro or, I, know, on, I know the process because it's... Yeah, on, on just the patents or on, on uh, enforcing as well? Uh, just uh, pick one or yeah. describe so on, everything? Yeah, on, on creating the patents, hundreds of thousands of euros, and on enforcing maybe at this point over a million. Mm -hmm. Uh, I uh, remember the story uh, in uh, 2017 on Tisha Mese where we put uh, a lot of products uh, with Shanti, which is original, with Marvin. And the Marvins had their first HMD there and uh, some kind of lawyers came by and uh, put everything down and uh, this is the paper which uh, says that you will pay the fee 100,000 uh, uh, euros or something like that. Uh, that's the way you enforce, you, you are enforcing it? Uh, I don't think it was 100,000 euros, but... Uh, yeah, it was like, oh. Maybe 10,000, I don't know. But uh, no, uh, is that the way that we enforce it? At the shows, you mean, or is that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we don't normally go to the shows at all. Um, it's, you know, a lot of the times at the shows, um, it's very difficult for us to find a place that we can show the product in the proper way. Um, and so, in that particular show, I was walking the show to meet with distributors like Libor, and uh, we also knew that there were a lot of products in Germany at the time that were infringing on our patents, and so we wanted to be able to walk through the show and identify to those people, and also give them the opportunity to take a license, because we're not trying to prevent other people from making products. What we're trying to do is say, okay, you want to use our IP, then you should pay us something for that. Is it working? Uh, yeah, some companies, like I, I think you brought up Marvin, they were very good, they took a license. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, a lot of people from our community smokes with uh, different products than Cloud, for example, uh, CWP Heatkeeper, uh, Zeppelin, uh, Quasar, and something like that. Uh, what is your attitude towards these companies? Yeah, I, I really like and respect Quasar, I think they they didn't even, it, their patent doesn't touch ours. So they also have patents and their intellectual property is very different from the Lotus. So the technique, the method that they use for heat management is different from cloud, from the Lotus. Um, and other companies, they like Zeppelin for example, they stopped creating a rotating lid because they didn't want to pay the license. And so, you know, for us, we look at it, I, I like to be a very fair person. And so if I take something from you, I'm going to give you something in return. Like if you give me a beer, I'm going to pay you for the beer, right? Two beers, you mean. Even two <laughs> beers, right? Yeah. And so I like to be fair. I like to be honest in business. I like to be ethical in business. And unfortunately, in our industry, the goal is, is to make money, to pour product into the product uh, market, to make the money, and then maybe they will do something else for the community or maybe they won't. As far as I know, no company has spent more on research and development, meaning improving the products, than cloud. For sure. There's no other company that I can point to. And I think hopefully people will consider this when they talk about our patents and our enforcement. Because it's not like I'm taking the money and buying a yacht, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm taking the money and I'm paying Reinvest. My, I'm reinvesting. I have a team of people that they support their family from the money that they make from cloud. So we're creating jobs. And at the same time, we're creating what I know are better products that are less harmful. That, look, I mean, like everybody is making a base and stem hookah now, right? And we wanted to give you guys something new because, quite frankly, you deserve it. I mean, why wouldn't you want something new? Um, and so this is the, the ethic of cloud. This is the uh, ethos of cloud. This is the purpose of cloud. Mm -hmm. Allow me one question. Uh, on the original loaders, from the back, there are some kind of uh, points like six or eight. Uh, in Czech Republic, we use the points to touch our tobacco, uh, not uh, everybody, but uh, it's uh, good for touching the tobacco and uh, 
let the heat uh, go through the tobacco mix. But what's the original intent of making this kind of uh, points there? The original intent was, number one, to, yes, allow that contact point, but also to help people to measure. So when we send people instructions on how to use a Lotus, we would say, okay, when you're using a Lotus One Plus, those bumps on the bottom yeah, bumps. should barely touch the tobacco. Barely touch. I mean, like maybe one millimeter or half a millimeter. It's not meant to be like all the way in, right? And then at that point, you know that it's the correct point you know that you have the tobacco at the right place so that when you're smoking, it's not those small points of contact that are creating the smoke. It's that you are at the correct distance for the lotus to push the hot air in, to allow the hot air to go in, and then create this really rich, beautiful smoke. So, uh, it's about... <laughs> You think really? Right. <laughs> so uh, you are the best, honestly. Like, this is amazing. I don't know if you have a timer back there. What's going on? It's fantastic. So you are saying the points are also for touching the tobacco, but you said uh, recently that uh, the proper experience is without the touch. Yeah. So so what uh -huh. we did with the Lotus Three? No, no, it's okay. It's still okay. Uh, what we did with the Lotus Three really? Is, what we did with the Lotus Three is that we created a product that makes it impossible, or not impossible, but very difficult to overpack, okay? Because we want people to be able to enjoy the hookah experience for a lifetime, mm -hmm. okay? Most of the people that are smoking are in their 20s or early 30s, maybe mid 30s, and at some point they stop because maybe their doctor will say, okay, this is giving you high blood pressure or the whatever. And a lot of the reason for that is because the way that they're smoking is shit. <laughs> So if we want to help you make it as easy as possible for you to have the smoking experience that you're looking for, but at the same time, make it as harmless as possible. So uh, speaking of which, please, teach us how to use your products properly. Which is the correct way smoking with, for example, with Ria Bowl uh, alongside with Cloud Lotus Free? Yeah. You so have with Ria Bowl here, I think the HMD is here. So. Yeah. If you're willing to do so, yeah. just open it and uh, tell us how to use your products properly. We don't need any tobacco. Uh, maybe someone has tobacco, please. Thank you, Peter. So we're trying to get better at giving you instructions because I will admit that we're we're a very very bad company when it comes to explaining how to use our products. So we created... Just don't touch it, it's hot. Just don't touch it, it's hot, yeah. And so we, we tried to do a little bit better job and we're always learning. I mean, we really always are trying. And then to be honest with you, sometimes people don't read the instructions. <laughs> so that's also... <laughs> yeah, that's awesome which is too. normal. I'm, I'm one of those people for sure. I take my iPhone out and I just start playing with it. I don't care. Um, so... Uh, that's what the quote is. It's a counterfeit? No, 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 I'm looking at the, I love reading the quotes, actually, I like the quotes. Um, and so, we would take the, the lotus out of the box, obviously. Um, we take the vitra out of the box. Oh, the instructions. <laughs> no, no, this, this is, yeah, exactly, you just threw it on the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's not my normal attitude, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we deliberately put the quotes in because I personally love quotes. I think learning from the wisdom of other people is helpful. And so this one says, we must believe that, there are gift that we are gifted for something and that this thing, at whatever cost, must be attained. So, and this is from Marie Curie. So I don't know if you guys know who Marie Curie is, but she was one of the, the pioneers in researching radiology, and unfortunately she died from exposure to radiation. But um, the samsaris, I think some of you are familiar with it. Uh, it comes ready to have the tobacco packed. So normally with the Lotus 3, the way that I would pack it is, I would pack right up to the edge where the Lotus sits, okay? So right up to the, that very, very top point where the Lotus sits down, and then that gives us the perfect distance. Thank you very much. That gives us the perfect distance. I will distance. make the space here. Yeah, thank you. For me personally, I like to use the Citra. I will unpack it. Yeah. And so... I'm your slave right now, so you can pick 
each one of these. Yeah, we'll use the metal one, it's fine. Just, no, the Actually, let me one. use the glass one because I can exp Well, I'll use the metal oh, okay, one. Okay, what's. One. No, no, it's okay. I'll use uh, the metal I will one. do it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, your yeah. glass one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, what I do is first we put in the citra. If I use the glass, the glass is the only one where I would put like one or two millimeters of tobacco underneath. So you make almost like a, a carpet of tobacco underneath because otherwise, the glass, because it's very hard to get the precise tolerances with the glass. Just with the metallic one? Only with the glass one. Oh. It is so use your glass one, here it okay, is. Okay, okay. So if it was the metal one, I would just start packing the tobacco right on top, okay? Mm -hmm. With the glass one, what I would do is... It's 10 juice, you're familiar. No, no, I'm looking to see what flavor it is. It doesn't say. You can see C70. It. Just smell it. C70. Hmm. Smells like citrus, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Citrus mint? <laughs> no, no, citrus, maybe. I think it's cashmere guava. Okay, you're much better with tangiers than I am, for sure. <laughs> I think I'm not, but... Uh... No, no, I don't use tangiers. Very, for me, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't smoke too much dark leaf. Uh, Why is that? It gives me a headache. Yeah. Even with your product? With anything, yeah. Oh. Dark leaf tobacco is, is too strong for me. I'm, I have a very... I have a very, I have a baby unicorn inside my lungs, so it's... it's uh, little... You know, a lot of guys from Czech community could say uh, you're a pussy, but... I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say that, but instead I said baby unicorn, so it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. But I'm not, you can smoke whatever you like. Don't fuck with the baby unicorn, though, I'll say right now. <laughs> baby unicorn... Uh, I fuck won't fuck with the baby unicorn. <laughs> That's not on my schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I put a very, very thin layer of... of um, Tobacco underneath, and I, I will say this: one of the things so that I, I do love it's about like tangiers, five or eight grams, maybe even less, no less. Like okay, so two, one gram of tobacco, something like very very little <laughs> bit. Okay. And then I put the the glass on top of that, mm -hmm. and so it looks and like push this. it or just yeah, push it. No, no, push it, and then it's there, and we created these vents on top to block most of the tobacco from going down, but Tangiers, they but do... It's a, but it's a funnel bowl, it won't come down until you overpack the shit out. No, 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 I'll show you the way I pack and you're gonna, you're ah, gonna okay, see. Okay, okay. I think one of the things I, I really respect about Tangiers is that they're very good about cutting their tobacco into fine pieces, which for me at home, I'll normally take the tobacco and I'll use scissors to do the same thing. Because I believe that the smaller pieces burn better than the large pieces. If you just think about it from it physics, it burns faster. But it's not case of a ten years because it's super original in terms of yeah. any other tobacco. Yeah, it's very, very obviously as as you are identifying, it's a great tobacco. Um, and then I just I start dumping it in basically. Basically, so. I would say it's the biggest secret in the hookah industry. How is the ten years tobacco made? Because other companies tries to. Yeah, and unfortunately, Make I, I don't, similar, but yeah, and, and I don't know if you guys know, but unfortunately, the owner passed away. Uh, yeah, yeah, this we, year, uh, sev uh, last year in two thousand and one. Yeah, he Eric. was. He was a very, very. I, I liked Eric. We didn't interact that much, but whenever I would interact with him, I was um, impressed by how smart he is, um, and also we were very similar in our desire to see our industry become clean. You think? Meaning, uh, you know. It was a myth for us. Ten years, like eight or seven years back, the original black tobacco, dark leaf tobacco from the U.S. And uh, yeah, we like it a lot here. I think somebody has to smoke this bowl, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think. Who would like to smoke smoking. the bowl? Yeah, we should, the, he's gonna come back with charcoal for sure. So you have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have the first volunteer. Nice. Yeah, somebody should smoke it. Um, so. So you use just your fork, not the hands, because uh, in Czech community we have like mixed approaches. We used forks, we use our pokers, and uh, most of us our hands. Because yeah, I we, would. We like to uh, make it would, dirty. Yeah, normally I would use my hand, but because we're sitting here on the stage with a very clean ah, you're shy. You're shy. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't want to ruin the, the you know the tea the tea set that this guy brought for me. It's very nice. Um, and so yeah, it looks something like this. Share it. So if you want, we can pass it around. So it's not fluffed, it's just slightly densed. I, I normally wouldn't pack it down anymore, mm -hmm. but you could if you really like the dense, maybe you can pass it around. So uh, that's the proper way of packing uh, with the uh, vitria bowl using citra. 
Yeah, and if you're not using the Citra, you still pack to the same level. But the Citra, it has another benefit, which is you're going to use less tobacco. And because the price of tobacco... And less coals. And less coals. But because the price of tobacco is going up, I mean, you know, why waste money? Because you, I, I think most of you understand that you don't need a massive amount of tobacco to have a really good smoke session. It can be a much uh, smaller amount of tobacco and it will give you an equally great session, no problem. We approximately use 20 grams, but yeah, the tobacco in Czech Republic is really expensive. And it's only going to get more expensive, I promise you, because I'm talking to people. Thank in you, the, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to the people in the industry and I know what's going to happen. Um, and so it's, it's, we want people to be able to enjoy their hookah. While we still can. But without the, the you know, their wallet becoming empty. Uh, and so, yeah, as you're passing it around, you'll see that it's, it's packed higher than what you would normally pack for a lotus. Um, and the reason for that is because the bottom of the lotus three is recessed. So we pulled it back about two millimeters. And so it becomes very difficult. And we added in these air channels mm -hmm. that really focus the heat. They radiate it down and then they focus it and they bring it back. And I can pass this around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can. But uh, you're in Czech Republic, so maybe it won't come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. We know everybody. And you're on camera, so we know everybody. <laughs> Like I said, don't fuck with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are uh, well. Also, they don't have the instructions. How are they going to use it? <laughs> <laughs> you are in the right mood for the next um, topic, which is unpop unpopular opinions. Maybe for you, maybe for the community. I will, uh, I will give you some kind of uh, quotes, and please uh, react to them. So the first quote is. The cloud products are overpriced. There are no mass products. There are no mass products? Yes. What does that mean? Uh, for example, Elferia is like 15,000 Czech crowns. It's not for the mass market. I understand what you're saying. Okay, I understand. Um, we, we don't feel like our products are overpriced. We feel like we're putting a price on the product that allows us to make enough money to continue operating the company, but also the quality of our products is very high, very high. I mean, we spend a lot of money making sure that the quality is excellent. Um, and then we also use the majority of that money for further research and development. So design, engineering, all these other things that we're doing so that we can continue to bring great products into the market. Do you think uh, you're, you're, you're making, you're doing a good job uh, communicating these kind of values in case uh, of no. the price? I mean, we try. When, when I do an Instagram Live, for example, I will try to explain, to pe because the question will always be asked, you know, why are your products so expensive? And we try to explain to people that it's not that we're trying to do what's called a cash grab, right? Like, I'm not saying, okay, come and buy this, and I'm going to get as much money from you as I can, and then I'm going to leave you. What we're doing is what every other, I think, great company in the world does, which is Elon Musk builds a Tesla for X dollars, and then he sells it for Y dollars. And that difference is what allows Tesla to make new models, to do the marketing that they need to do, to grow Research the company. Research and development. Everything, to do the, the growth of the company, develop, you know, uh, all these things. The counterfeiters don't have this. The counterfeiters wait to see what we do, they copy it, and then they throw it in the market. So they bypassed all of the expense that we had to put out of our pocket to make a product, and then they sell it to the community. I have an experience uh, about this topic. Um, three or four years ago, I'm not really sure when you launched Cloud Lotus uh, 2, but uh, I, went to a lo to, I went to a local hookah shop and uh, I witnessed that some uh, Chinese guy went by, bought your product and uh, uh, told, the, uh, told us something like this. Yeah, this product is nice. We'll have a copy in uh, two months. It uh, will be one to one. Yeah, one to one is, uh, we're saying we're going to cut the bullshit. It's not, but regardless, um, that for me, it's, it breaks my heart. Because I know, for example, on the Lotus 3, that we spent almost one year in development on the Lotus 3 and how hard my team worked. Really, they worked their asses off, you know? And to see that they do all of that work and then somebody comes in and they say, okay, we're going to copy the product one to one or one to one, it's not... Um, I think it's not what's going to give people the, the benefit in the future. Because if there's not a company like Cloud 
I don't know who is going to do the innovation. Yeah, uh, the company uh, of that guy was called Van de Hooker. It's, uh, Send it to uh, my attorneys. Uh, it's <laughs> a, a huge uh, producer of counterfeits. So, n next statement. The best cloud products are the original cloud loaders and the original Samsara's Vitria. Yeah. Uh, I think that most of the time, if people are not using the new products correctly, or if they don't give it a chance, because sometimes a friend will use the product incorrectly, or based on their own taste, they will tell everybody else that they know, this is a shit product, don't go get it. But maybe that's not fair. Maybe what's fair is for people to try it for themselves, to understand, okay, is this actually worth what they're claiming that it's worth, or should we just ignore it? I think it requires a personal experience to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, the third statement. Your patent, your patent practices slow down the innovation process in the HMD segment. No, I, if anything, I think it increased it because innovation is not, you know, one company taking our product, changing the color and changing the position of the vents and maybe adding in, instead of bumps on the bottom, they add in lines on the bottom, right? That's not innovation. That's essentially taking what we did and modifying it so that they can sell it, okay? Mm -hmm. Innovation is what Quasar did, which is they looked and they said, okay, cloud already did this. What are the other ways that we can do HMD without infringing on cloud's patents? That's innovation. All the other shit is what we would call parasitic. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, speaking about uh, colors, uh, your Cloud Lotus OnePlus uh, were made in uh, different colors mm -hmm. recently. And uh, a lot of people in Czech Republic experience that the uh, color is going away. Uh, and it's, I don't know how to say it in English, but it, it falls off. Yeah. No, it's not fading, it falls off. Flakes off. Flakes off, yeah, flakes ah, off. Ah, okay. Uh, we know that with the first batch there were some problems and that was our fault. It was part of the quality control process at the factory. Anybody who has that process should contact us and we would replace the product. But it should not flake off. With the black one for sure, because the black one we use nearest. a very... With the nearest we use a very special technique that it's not paint. <laughs> so It's implemented to the metal. It's I Exactly. We've actually changed the property of the metal to make it black. So it's not flaking off. If anything, they're scratching it off. Um, we use ceramic for all the other colors because it is an inert material, it's not toxic. The companies that are using anodizing, we don't use anodizing because we know that the anodizing uh, eventually at high temperature it will release gas into the smoke and that gas is harmful and it will never leave your body, okay? With the stainless steel we use a special process called PVD, porous vapor deposition, which is safe. So it's an organic process and it's also safe and it doesn't come off. So if you have one of our stainless steel Lotus 2 or Lotus 3, one of the things that you will notice is that the color won't come off. You literally have to scratch it off. So uh, back in the days you were using aluminium, Dural, I think, and nowadays your uh, cloud lotuses are made from stainless steel? No. So we oh. have an aluminum line mm -hmm. because some people prefer the aluminum because the aluminum does heat up faster. And then we have a stainless steel line, which doesn't heat up as fast as the aluminum, but if you looked at it as a kind of parabolic curve, the aluminum goes up faster and the stainless steel a little bit slower, but when they reach the plateau, they're both at the same place. So for example, because I'm traveling, I'm traveling with aluminum because it's lighter. So when I'm going to you know, uh, check my bag, they don't give me a hard time. But uh, the stainless steel is the one that I normally use at home. I uh, didn't see uh, that variety of your products. I uh, thought it was all the same, like the all is uh, made of aluminum. No. So uh, Lotus One Plus, all of them are aluminum and they use a ceramic coating. Lotus Two is aluminum. Uh, there's only one silver in aluminum and then all the other colors are stainless steel using PVD. And then the Lotus Three has multiple colors in aluminum and multiple colors in stainless steel because we want to give people a chance to express. Mm -hmm. Does the aluminium and the stainless steel behave differently in terms of uh, heat management? No, like I said, uh, the, the aluminum will, the metal itself will get hot much faster than stainless steel, but once it reaches the temperature, which we would call the homeostasis point, at that point uh, it's the same amount of heat going into the tobacco. 
-hmm. So it's the hot gas that's going into the tobacco and the heat being radiated off of the metal. Okay, let's move to another unpopular opinion. I have to read it. Some innovations are a step backwards. The missing cool trays on your hookahs, chrysalis, adjusting the some sort of shape in order to sell the product that repairs it back into the right functionality, Citra, the shape of cloud loaders 2 and 3 is not fitting the majority of the bowls on the market, etc. So are really some, uh, some of your innovations a step backwards? No, I don't think that they're a step backwards. I know that we did make a mistake with the Lotus 3 that we didn't make it so that it could stay on many of the clay bowls. Unfortunately, we can only test some of what you find on the market and we don't have every single bowl in the market. I mean, there are, I think at this point, maybe almost 100 bowl manufacturers in the world, so we can't test all of the bowls. But we realized the mistake and we're creating a fix for that so that anybody who bought a Lotus 3, we will send them free a new base that will work with other bowls. And Cloud is, I think, the only company in our industry that, you know, with the Altheria, we sent free upgrades to everybody who had the Altheria because the upgrade makes the product better. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I hate as a consumer is when I buy a product and a new, better version comes out. And so we said, no, in this case... So we're constantly uh, improving and sending the new improvements to the customers. If, if the improvement should have been there in the beginning, we will send the improvement to the customers free of charge, which is what we did in Czech, which is what we did in throughout Europe and everywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And we will do the same thing with the Lotus 3. Speaking about hookahs, so why, uh, why did you remove the ashtrays? It's a significant part of the hookah. It is. And uh, for me, again, it comes back to how are people using this product? And what is the the aesthetic, the, the beauty of the product. How does it look? And for me, the ashtray, especially when there's a lot of charcoal, I mean, you know, if, if when he was coming to change the charcoal and he piled the, the, the coal all around this thing, it would become more and more messy, more and more ugly. So, and so it's, it, uh, the look is more important for you? No, and then we developed the uh, Eras, which is our ashtray. Yeah, but it's another it's extra product. product. It's a separate product, that's so, right. Uh, uh, you were speaking about the product itself. So why not providing people the functional version from the beginning? Why uh, making? Why pushing them to uh, buy another product, which is a simple ashtray? Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't think we're pushing them to buy another product because when he comes and he takes the, the charcoal, instead of putting it on the ashtray on the hookah, he puts it back in the bucket and he takes it away. Normally, if somebody's using the ashtray on the hookah, it's because they're adding in new charcoal. And in that situation, they're normally, I mean, I don't think they're holding it in their hands, although I've seen Instagram videos that are pretty crazy. They're coming in with a bucket, they take off the old charcoal, put it in there, and then put the new charcoal on top. Yeah, the ashtray may, is Maybe a, that's the uh, way people uh, do it uh, in the U.S. market, but not... So much people have uh, their charcoal holder uh, in their homes, uh, so we are really using the ashtrays in Czech Republic. So that's why I'm asking because... We were just uh, talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Personally for me, uh, the missing uh, ashtray is a step backwards. But step uh, backwards. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you told me your opinion, that's completely right, uh, that's yeah. nice about the variety. Yeah, so. and I think maybe in the future you would see products that would allow people to add it to the actual Eltheria or Calyx. Yeah, two I think is enough. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's right. Another unpopular opinion. Regarding cloud products, the look is more important than its functionality. You were saying that uh, it's a combination. That's the design, the functionality and the look. But uh, uh, we can... Uh, take a look on the beautiful hookahs, but uh, for many people, it uh, the look is over the functionality. Speaking of ashtrays and etc., uh, do you think it's uh, true or not? I think when it comes to something like the ashtray, uh, yes, we made a design decision that if we added an ashtray to something like this, it just wouldn't look good. And we want people to, when they're at their house and they're having guests over, it should look beautiful. You know, when somebody puts out a charcuterie, they don't put out, you know, like a cheese board or a meat board mm -hmm. or whatever. They're not putting out, uh, you know, the plastic with the meat or the paper with the cheese. They're making it look beautiful. This mm -hmm. is a, a psychological response that human beings will have in general 
to the things that they're consuming. Whether it's a drink that you go to a bar and they make this really beautiful cocktail with you know, a, a drop of uh, mango syrup on top of the foam and all these other things. Or whether it's you using the product at your house and you're sitting there and it's beautiful and it's not messy and there's not ash everywhere and all these other things. Okay. Last unpopular opinion. Cloud is not listening to the community and doesn't fulfill their needs. For example, the comeback of the original Cloud Lotus One, the shape is the most popular in Czech Republic and in many other states. Are you listening? Are you truly listening to the community and fulfill their needs? Or you just go your own way, hoping that the community will get your point? I think that um, we're doing a couple of things. Yes, we're hearing what people are saying, for sure. Some of it is because one or two people in the community will make a statement, and then the other people that are following that opinion will jump on and they will say, oh, this is the exact correct thing. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the reality of the product's performance at all. Other people are um, trying to get us to make a product that they want specifically for themselves. And in this case, we can't give everybody exactly what they want, but what we can do is we can create the best possible product for as many people as possible. So what can we do if, for example, thousands of us really love the original Lotus and to, wants, uh, we want to buy it another time because when it was released, it was like 2014-15 and uh, the vast majority of our community wasn't even smoking uh, back in the days. So what we can do if yep. you are saying you will fulfill our needs uh, if we are outnumbered, uh, what can we do? So I, I will tell you this, um, if we brought in a Lotus, the original Lotus back into the market, immediately people would complain and I'll tell you what the complaints would be. One is it doesn't fit enough charcoal because the walls come in, okay? So they would say, I can't get enough charcoal. But you're there. saying that the less charcoal is better. For sure. The but, less but, heat is better. Right. But people would still make the complaint. I'm not saying what I think, I'm saying what the complaints would be. I'm, next, ju I'm just like to complain with you, so... That's fine. <laughs> the, next com the next complaint that we would hear is that the charcoal is blacking out on the bottom. So not all of the charcoal is cooking through yeah. because the, the base, the top of the base of the lotus, the first lotus, was almost flat. And so a lot of the times when you would take your charcoal out, the bottom, I don't know, maybe three or four millimeters were completely black. But you have to pay attention to your charcoals and work with it. If you are paying attention to your charcoals and playing with it, it will last uh, one and a half, two hours. Yeah, I mean, we could also add a piano to the side of it, but there's, <laughs> there's too much complexity, you know? Yeah. I think people, when they smoke, like for example, when I smoke, I don't want to be constantly playing with the charcoal, rotating and doing all these other things. So we added the platform to the bottom of the Lotus One Plus, to the Lotus 2 and to the Lotus 3 so that the air can flow and feed the charcoal. Yeah, I, right? uh, I can understand, but the bumps, they are uh, rather uh, tall. So when the charcoal uh, is getting smaller and smaller, uh, the coals are falling from the bumps. Right, and so in that situation, normally if the coals are falling from the bumps, it's easier just to put another piece of charcoal in because if you're already saying, look, I want to sit there and rotate the charcoal every 20 minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever to make sure that it's cooking on every side, which is easier, just to wait and then say, okay, I'm going to put another piece of charcoal on. You know, at some point, people have to understand that it's not that we're not listening, but if a child comes to me and they say, listen, I want you to give me a flamethrower and I want to go run in the forest, I would say, no, this is not a good idea. <laughs> but Elon Musk would grade them with one. Elon Musk would raise money for the mole company, right? Yeah. So the boring company. So the, the reality is that we, we look at it from the perspective of, I want to make sure that we are delivering value to the consumer, meaning a better product for a fair price. Not that, okay, 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 2 million people want the original Lotus and we know we can make money off of that. That's a cash grab, right? That's not fair to the community because I wouldn't feel ethically correct coming to everybody here and saying, guys, you know, we did the Lotus 3, but guess what? We now have a Lotus that you guys can smoke and that this Lotus is not going to be as good as the Lotus 3 for sure. But it's for the fans. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I get your yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm interrupting no, 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 you. No, 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 no. I was finished. I mean, basically, we, we know that what we're creating is better. And it's up to the community in the same way that when we released the original Lotus, to allow us the time to 
to explain how to use it properly so that when you know how to use the product properly, you can come to the understanding that, yeah, cloud is always working to make things better. They're not working to, oh, it's more beautiful and we can charge more money for this, so put this into the market. No, we're making it more beautiful for sure because now we have the technical capabilities to do that, manufacturing and design and engineering, but we're also making it better. That was a really interesting part. Let's move to another topic. For, uh, has cloud suffered from the COVID-19 uh, consequences? Um, I think in the beginning it was very good for cloud because people were, who were normally going to lounges couldn't go to lounges and so they were buying Chrysalis Altheria, they were buying uh, our products and they were using them at home. Which for us was great because we realized that some people who would never buy a hookah were for the first time buying their, and we do a lot of like, you know, um, email exchanges or so we were even, on the hotline. Or even Zoom okay. or, vi or phone calls, yeah, exactly. And so we know that for a lot of the people, they're saying, this is my first hookah, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to use hookah, how should I use it best? And so we take the time to teach them, and actually because of that, because they come to it with that beginner mindset, this new mindset that I've never experienced it, they're actually getting a better experience than the pros. Because the pros are like, I know how to smoke, I don't need you to tell me how to smoke. And I say, okay, just so you know, it's like if Elon Musk comes to me and tells me how to use the Tesla, I'm going to listen to him. Maybe I won't use it in the way he's telling me to use it, but I'm going to pay attention, mm -hmm. right? And we don't even get that respect. We get it, oh, you know, this is a shit product, you guys put it out, you guys are like, you know, weak, you guys used to be good, you guys suck now. And I know what's happening, actually. So it was a win for you. You won the market at that time. Okay. So no consequences. No consequences. Like uh, in uh, uh, regarding COVID, uh, the COVID nineteen situation, for example, in shipping, logistics. Oh uh, yeah, the supply manufacturing. chain has been a disaster for us. It's been very very hard. Uh, number one, you know, the whole world. You guys are buying other products, so you know what I'm talking about. The whole world is backed up. So right now, for example, in Los Angeles, what a shipment that used to take us three and a half weeks to receive from China now might take us almost three months. And so, and it changes all the time. One day they'll tell us it's going to be there in two weeks and another day they'll tell us, no, it's now four weeks. So from that perspective, it's been terrible for us mm -hmm. and I think every other company on the planet and we're doing our best to deal with it. Yeah, about dealing with it, my second question is, uh, what was the company reaction on the recent war events uh, regarding the Ukrainian and Russian market, the production logistics? No, I, I think generally speaking, companies are, are, are not identities, they're not individuals, and so them commenting on anything is not correct. Me personally, I can tell you that I think it's horrible. Not because it's Russia and Ukraine, I just think war is not the correct way to do anything. Mm. And so when I see people suffering, I look at that and I, I as a human being have empathy and compassion mm. for those people. Because it's not right that somebody should have to leave, because I lost my home, right? I was born in Iran and we had to leave the country to go to the United States because otherwise maybe my dad would have been executed, right? Mm. And so... I know how hard it is to go from your homeland to another country, learn a new language, learn a new culture, try and make a new life. Mm -hmm. And for those parents, for the children, this is hell. Wherever they are. I mean, you guys in the Czech Republic have been very good about absorbing refugees. We have a lot of refugees here. You've been very grac gracious in that regard. But even with that kind of hospitality, they still would prefer to be in home. Uh, the original question uh, was... Uh, well, let me just add something. Yeah. I also don't think it's fair to blame the Russian people because I also see some of that happening. You know, I see people attacking the Russian hookah comp companies and saying, I'm not going to buy Russian hookah products or anything like that. And I don't think that's also part of the culture of hookah. We had, culture, some, uh, we had some boycotts on the products, but the, the general issue is that... Uh, Czech, German, or other uh, uh, shops, for example, uh, are not able to bring the products from these countries. I, I understand. And at the end of the day, I think 
part of the culture of hookah is opening the space for us to share ourselves with each other, like you and I are doing right now. This is the exact example. We're drinking together. If there was food, we would be eating together. And because there is hookah, we are literally breathing together. This is the most intimate thing you can do. Share oh. the breath. It really is. Yeah, yeah. You're taking these things in, and in that process, we're connecting. Hopefully, we're connecting with the audience as well. Mm -hmm. And we come out of it slightly different human beings than we started it. Mm -hmm. That's my next question. What's your attitude towards hookah? Is it just a part of your business or a genuine hobby? No, I love it. Because for me, uh, when I discovered hookah, it was in London in 2001. And at that time, I was traveling. Um, I had just finished law school and I traveled the world for three months. And in London, I was with friends. But then when I left London and I went to Paris or whatever, I had nobody there. I had no friends there. And so I would go to the hookah lounges that were in Paris and I would sit down and I would be alone. But somebody would sit next to me with their friends and I would say, what are you smoking? And if they spoke English, we would start double talking. Double apple. Yeah, at that point, double apple was okay for me. But <laughs> it's not now, I promise I can't smoke double. But they, we would start talking and then they would say, do you want to taste it? And I would say, yes. And then I would give them my, my pipe to taste, right? Mm -hmm. And we became kind of friends over that. We would talk about the life, they would ask me about my travel, I would ask them about their life. So and you like was, the social impact of hookah? I think that if hookah was given the chance, that it could be one of the tools that human beings could use to get over the bullshit that we're experiencing. Like I come from the United States where people don't even want to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a room and you're smoking a hookah with somebody, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, Trump or Biden or Obama, it doesn't matter. You would talk. You know, and when you talk, at the very least, even if you don't agree, you and I don't agree about some of these things, we're not attacking each other. We're having a conversation and, and we are two human beings sharing an experience. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, what is your lifestyle? What are your values? Like, what's the cloud lifestyle? You mean traveling, uh, sitting out with people, making fun? What are your values? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, I can't, I haven't been able to travel as much because of the pandemic. This is my first time in Europe since 2019. Um, but that is one of the values. And it's not traveling as a tourist, going to a country, sitting in a bus. And it's not that that's wrong, but I don't think that the Getting people, speed, speed tickets. Getting speeding tickets. <laughs> it's about going into the culture and getting lost. Right? Like when I go into the culture of a place, when I came to Czech for the first time, I rented a car and I drove into the countryside. I didn't just stay in Prague. And there are so many beautiful things to see in Prague. And for sure, I went to go see the clock tower, the castle, mm -hmm. all these things, of course. The, the Charles Bridge, all these things are important. But that's not the only part of Czech culture. And so if I want to experience that, I have to step out of the comfort of that place. Mm -hmm and go into the country and get lost and maybe... To know, Ostrava, to Brno. <laughs> what is it, to, to Brno, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean like, you know, the, the cool thing about like the, some of the factories that we work with here is that, as you know, the glass factories are in the middle of forests because that's where they started. They needed the wood and so they built the factory in the forest. And the water. Yeah, and so you're there, I would go and I would see these small villages, you know, and I would stop and I would have, you know, mm. uh, traditional Czech food and I would sit Svičkova. there. Svičkova. Uh, the soup, what is it, like a borscht or something? Uh, goulash. Goulash, yeah. Goulash or polifu. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so for me, these are the things that I value. And I think that the people that love hookah value. Mm -hmm. Because that's why in a hookah community, somebody that lives in San Diego can meet somebody who lives in Prague and then they go and visit each other, right? I yeah. don't know many forums that this I happens got, in. I will, attend, uh, I will attend some show in the San uh, Diego Zoo and you will have a beer with me in Prague. 100%. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Speaking about Czech Republic, uh, are you familiar with our hookah culture? Because uh, for, uh, from my point of view, we do a lot of things differently. For example, our uh, lounge or tea rooms culture, it's one of the best in the world. Yeah. Uh, we are, mm, our origin is based on tea rooms, which uh, is, uh, you, you can see it uh, anywhere in the world. And are you familiar with our culture, our hookah culture? Uh, not as familiar as you or anybody else here, but to a certain extent, yes. And from the first time that I went to a lounge, it was with Peter and Libor. And I was 
amazed at how beautiful they are. Like Caviar, we're sitting in it right now. It's a beautiful space. It's a really nicely done space. They paid attention to the design of the space. Mm -hmm. They created an environment where when you go in there, it's not like heavy, mu loud music and like, you know, black lights and all this other shit. It's a very nice space that you can sit down and have conversations and connect with friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can say that I really respect the culture. And in terms of the companies that are here, um, whether it's Marvin or Shisha Original or these other companies, the design is fantastic. Mm -hmm. People are, are investing in taking the time to create products that are beautiful and that work really well. Which appeals you. Which what? It's appealing to you. Of course. That's what I would want to see in the hookah market. Of course. I want, it, it's not, we're never going to be 100% of the hookah market. Mm -hmm. But if I know that I can go and buy, for example, a wuka and put it on my table and enjoy looking at the product and mm -hmm. admiring the fact that they thought about, okay, how can we in integrate wood mm -hmm. into this glass and how can we use a bayonet lock to lock this thing? I love those things. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. Speaking about lounges, uh, what's the situation in the U.S. market? You know, the U.S. is such a big country and with so many laws that are different that depending on the city that you're in, the lounge quality will be different. Mm -hmm. I don't, for example, love the lounges in Los Angeles because, because of the law in Los Angeles, it's very hard to do a very nice lounge. You can't serve... I think there is Mojo, there is Hookah Place. There are uh, different places, but they, for example, they can't serve tea mm -hmm. under the law, right? They can't serve you any food under the law. And for me, when I go to a it's lounge... It's a domestic law. It's, it's a law that applies only in Los Angeles, for example, but other cities have similar laws. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Miami, for example, it's very different. Or if you go to New York, different set of laws. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find different quality in the lounges. I think that the U.S. lounge culture is behind what we would see, for example, in Czech mm -hmm. or in other parts of the world. And that's unfortunate because the U.S. hookah community is very active, but it's also under attack. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I spotted that a lot of uh, laws are uh, against hookahs and uh, people uh, use their voice to fight uh, against it. Yeah. In a Los Angeles, I thought last year it was the ban of hookahs or ban of the flavored tobacco. They're, they're constantly bringing laws trying to prevent flavored tobacco. And for anybody who uses hookah, they know that they're using hookah because they love the different flavors. Like if you go to somebody that, the home of somebody that loves hookah, mm -hmm. they don't have unflavored tobacco. They have many different types, many different brands of tobacco. And almost like a chef, would prepare food with different ingredients, mm -hmm. or a mixologist would prepare their cocktail with different ingredients. They're making these very unique, only to them, experiences for their guests. And we're losing that. And we're losing it, why? Because there is a significant part of our industry that only cares about the money. When the hookah business dies, they don't care. They will go and they will start selling keychains. They don't give a fuck. And this breaks my heart. Because I know how much I love hookah. I've invested, at this point, 12 years of my life building this company. And if it was any other industry, any other industry, I would be, the cloud would be a billion dollar company. But because we're in the hookah industry where the lounge says... Limited. Yeah, the lounge says, okay, I can buy a Chinese knockoff for five euro. Why should I buy this one? Fuck it, I'm going to buy it for five euro. And then I'm going to sell it to my customer for 15 or 20 euro. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter that cloud is getting hurt by that. Because I, at least in this moment, I'm making a little bit of extra money. But over the course of a lifetime of a lounge, what, is, what difference does it make if they buy the original product? Really, none. It, if anything, it supports them because then we can develop even better products for them. This is the small mentality that I believe is the biggest threat. We don't, the, the industry does not behave like the consumer. The consumer is very communal. The industry is at war constantly, all of them. Stabbing each other in the back, cheating each other, whatever they can do. Do you experience this kind of shit in the US market? Everywhere in the world, it doesn't matter which market we're in, all over the world. Because the, the people, for the most part, that are working inside of the industry, they don't care about the hookah as a symbol of, of community and unification. They look at the hookah as a euro or a dollar or a RMB or whatever the hell mm -hmm. currency they use. So what's the future for Cloud? Do you have some kind of specific achievements you want to reach? 
I think in the ideal world, if I could say this is my fantasy for cloud, it would be that number one, we are able to continue to develop products and bring things like the electric head and even better filtration systems mm -hmm. to the hookah. That we're able to bring even better flavor to the hookah, continue to innovate on design, create different kinds of products that allow people to discover the brand, and ideally find ourselves in lounges like Caviar or maybe even cloud lounges where mm -hmm. people can go and have a very, very unique and excellent experience. That's what I would hope for cloud. What the future will actually <laughs> deliver to our doors, I don't know. And if you could be a prophet, uh, what's the future of our hookah community, of hookah smoking in five, ten years? Because I think uh, we are struggling against the laws and uh, yeah, that's the main uh, problem. I don't think it's just the laws that are the main problem. I think it's that a lot of the people in the community um, they don't operate based on the reality and they create factions okay and these different factions are at war with each other I know because I talk to different bloggers around the world right people who are involved in your communities that you might even know their names I talk to some of them I will you know via zoom or in person I will have, sit down and have conversations with them and they also tell me about the pain that they experience and how on some level they've just given up trying to participate because when they do participate they're under attack immediately because oh whether it's cloud or another company why are you defending that company that company is shit shut up sit down if you go to a party and people treat you like that how long will you stay in the party not long two free beers two free beers <laughs> you walk out with the beers right <laughs> so i think that if I was a prophet and I could predict the future, I would say that there are a few things that are eating away the hookah community. One of them is the industry itself. It's so fragmented and so focused on it should only be me, right? That Like no corporations or something? Like no cooperation, but that only my company should be successful. Whether it's a tobacco brand or a hardware brand, they look at it from that perspective. And that's the wrong mindset, especially in hookah. Mm -hmm. Then there is not good information there's not good information available to the user because when the user goes to get information they're not getting opinions they're getting what they are told is facts and so what do you do with that okay showing them the ways not, not showing them not, the ways not, showing not them the... my way saying this is the only way that it should no no, no it's okay it's okay yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, for example, what I do is not just stating this is the proper and the only one way how to operate hookah. I'm just showing my audience a lot of ways how to achieve their bill of the experience. I think that's good. You're unique in the industry. I don't think everybody does that. I think most of the bloggers, it becomes about vanity, okay? And so they want to say, I am the authority, I'm the expert, I am the Leonardo da Vinci of hookah, everybody should listen to me. And this is not fair to the consumer because you like smoking tangiers, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I came to the hookah community from day one and you said smoke tangiers, I would smoke it and then maybe I wouldn't get the experience that I'm looking for and so I would stop, right? And you can blame me because I told you to no, smoke tangiers. No, I wouldn't years. even blame you. I would just go and pick up a vape or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and this is the problem, that we don't open the conversation. The way that you and I are sharing this conversation right now, the way that we're sharing the pipes, is not what happens, unfortunately, in real life. And that is a threat to the industry as a whole. So uh, we are at the end of uh, our conversation. Is there something you want to say to your Czech audience or the worldwide audience, some kind of message? I, I mean, are there any questions that they have? Uh, after that. Oh, after that. Uh, is there something that I want to say? Um, I would say that it's, it's been a privilege, you know, doing what we've done and to have the trust and to have you guys allow us to develop the brand and the name that we've developed. It's very meaningful. Um, I would say that I, I hope, even if not, you're not using our products, that you are communicating with us and with other manufacturers, 
trying to explain the things that you want and that if we don't do that thing, that you don't take it as a sign of we mm -hmm. are rejecting you, but that maybe there's another vision in that space that we're trying to execute and that our goal always is to deliver to you the best that we can. Thank you, Reza. Thank you. Uh, je tady někdo, kdo by chtěl položit Rezovi nějakou otázku? Jestli jo, tak uh, my, prosím, hoďte mikrofon. Okay. <laughs> so, Reza, we have uh, uh, the first question here. Look at this beautiful girl. Hello, hello. And please answer. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I would actually like to ask you, uh, you said you don't use glass on your hookahs. Is that right? No, we, we, you can get a glass as an upgrade. It's a separate item for the Eltheria and the Monarch comes with glass. Yeah, okay, but if you use the plastic and the silicone, isn't there a chance or a possibility that uh, it would catch a smell from the tobacco and from like... Ghosting. Like uh, a bad smell, yeah. You're, you're saying the plastic. Uh, yeah. No, the kind of plastic that we use is a very, very high grade plastic uh, formulated by a company called DuPont. And DuPont also makes uh, Gorilla Glass, for example, for mm -hmm. the iPhones. They're one of the best chemical companies in the world. And the plastic that we use is uh, scratch resistant. Uh, it should stay clear, uh, meaning like it doesn't become yellow. Um, it's not toxic at all. Uh, they use it actually a lot in food products. So like in wine glasses that you would use outside or things like that. Um, and so, uh, no, it's very high quality. So it doesn't affect any other hookahs you, you make in the future? Like in like some like five years, if you use the hookah, you don't get a smell, it's still the same as new? It should be. I mean, we haven't had it in the market for five years, but we've never, we, we haven't had a complaint about the plastic ghosting, no. So neither on the base nor on the, on the uh, dome or in the inner vessel are we getting complaints about ghosting at all. Um, but in five years, maybe we would hear something. But right now, we haven't heard anything. And the Eltheria has been in the market since uh, 2019. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good Good question. Question. So everything's all right. Nice. Reza, it's time to end this, not shit, but a great uh, <laughs> opportunity to speak with you because you flew from the United States to Czech Republic, speaking with me, speaking with the audience. And it's a great honor for me, for Shanti, for a Czech audience that you came by, the inventor of the original Cloud Lotus and many other products uh, uh, later then. So <clears throat> I, thank you. I'm really grateful that you came. Thank you so much thank for you. the chat and let's enjoy the rest of the evening. Yeah, I would love to, yeah. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I hope that you guys didn't get bored. I saw some people leave and I'm like, gosh, this is gonna happen. There are hookahs out there, you know. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. But is somebody gonna smoke, smoke this? Yeah. Jestli někdo chce rezou nabitou korunku, tak v pohodě stačí se přihlásit. Stačí vzít do ruky a dát jí dýmkaři. Jestli někdo teda chce. I hope that uh, whoever smokes it enjoys the pack, because uh, I did the best that I could. <laughs>